Kate Young, and you're listening to This is Purdue, the official podcast for Purdue University. As a Purdue alum and Indiana native, I know firsthand about the family of students and professors who are in it together, persistently pursuing and relentlessly rethinking. Who are the next game changers, difference makers, ceiling breakers, innovators? Who are these boilermakers? Join me as we feature students, faculty, and alumni taking small steps toward their giant leaps and inspiring others to do the same. When you have a strong work ethic and you have to work for what you get, you're appreciative. You don't feel entitled. I believe that that's part of the product that Purdue puts out. Rusty Roof has had quite an interesting career path. I guess the easiest way to refer to me is I am an investor, advisor, director in startup ventures here in Silicon Valley. And then I also fashion myself to try to be a, as, as generous as I can philanthropist. I wear a lot of different hats. They're fun hats. As Rusty just said, he's an investor and advisor. He's a philanthropist. He's founded companies and held CEO and EVP positions for several global entities. He serves on multiple corporate boards, including Glassdoor, and is chairman emeritus of the Grammy Foundation in Los Angeles. He was appointed by President Barack Obama to the President's Advisory Committee for the Arts for the Kennedy Center and was coordinating national co-chair for technology for Obama. Oh, and before all of these business and tech world accolades, Rusty spent six years in commercial radio as an on-air personality. He's also a proud Purdue College of Liberal Arts graduate. An interesting aspect to Rusty's story is that he didn't have the typical Purdue student experience. Rusty actually transferred to Purdue as a junior. I asked him when he first heard about Purdue. So my earliest recollection of Purdue was when I was in middle school, and we had this basketball player from Jeffersonville High School named Wayne Walls that had taken the Jeff Red Devils to the Final Four in uh, Indiana a couple times. When he left high school, he was recruited by Purdue. He spent four years there. He was a all-American basketball player at Purdue. And that was it. I mean, I didn't know anything else. We, in Southern Indiana, where I grew up in, down by the Ohio River, there was this other school that people talked about all the time that was the closer Indiana State School. And then across the river was the University of Louisville. And so this idea of three hours away from us in the cornfields up in the upper part of the state, you just didn't hear a lot about. But Wayne Walls was my first recollection of it. I originally went to Hanover College. So I spent two years at Hanover. My direction was I, I was going to go to Wabash. I, was, I thought I was going to be a Lilly Scholar at Wabash. Turned out being that they gave 12 of them, and I was the alternate, number 13. You know, they said, oh, you still have a chance. And I'm like, uh, yeah, really? Somebody's actually going to give up being a Lilly Scholar, which was all expenses paid, room, board, tuition, a summer in Europe. I mean, yeah, that's not going to work. But I had put all my eggs in one basket. And out of the blue, I got a call from Hanover College that said, hey, we understand, you know, all this has happened. You know, would you want to come to Hanover? And I'm like, I got to go someplace. This is back before, <laughs> back before the days of when you decided your early acceptance schools and all that. We didn't do that. You know, you didn't do that. So I actually went to Hanover for two years. After my sophomore year, in my sophomore year, I was like, this is too small. I need someplace bigger. I was a radio and television disc jockey, radio disc jockey at the time. That's what I wanted to do. I was a communications major, working at a little radio station in Madison, Indiana, and then also down in Louisville during breaks and summers and things. And Purdue had seven commercial radio stations. That was a big deal to have someplace that had that. My girlfriend at the time was also at Purdue. She was a material science engineer. We started having these conversations about where am I going to go to get it? And it was like, well, seems logical. I'll go try Purdue. And I actually got a job on the radio before Purdue accepted me. So I was going there no matter what. That was at WASK AM and FM. That's how I ended up at Purdue. So I transferred there my junior year. And then I ended up graduating. And then I ended up coming back and getting my master's degree so I got my four years in. I just had to do it in a different way. Were you intimidated to come to Purdue as a junior? A little bit because I had been a residence hall advisor at Hanover in my sophomore year. Going into the residence halls 
and living in a dorm was not something I wanted to do. So I lived off campus my first year at Purdue, my junior year. I was really worried that I wouldn't be able to connect, right? Big school. The big part of it didn't really bother me as much, but just the idea of, so how am I going to get involved? What am I going to do? And one of the first things I did was I got involved with Old Masters. I was a host in my junior year. And then my senior year, I joined the central committee and was in charge of the host and hostesses. And then that turned into being tapped for mortarboard, you know, so it kind of quickly came together, if you will. But, you know, I had to search out and try to find something to get involved with that I could create a network of friends, because otherwise it was just my girlfriend's friends and me living off campus. So a little bit intimidating, just a little extra work too. So Rusty came to Purdue and kicked his junior year off with a bang. But as you heard at the start of this episode, Rusty is no longer working in radio. I asked him what made him want to go into radio in the first place. I really did it because my dad was a radio and television personality in Louisville. And I'm the classic son, wanted to do what dad did, and just kind of grew up around all of that. Also grew up a lot around the arts because he was very involved in the arts and involved in theater. After he got out of television and radio, he became a teacher in our high school in Jeffersonville. Where he led the theater department. He led the radio and television little station that they had. And so, you know, a product of my environment, that's what I wanted to do. Now, once I got to the point where I graduated, I was working in Indianapolis, I realized it wasn't what I wanted to do, which was a little late in the game to figure that out after you've already got a degree and graduated. Then I made the left-hand turn and went into business. But yeah, all I wanted to do, I guess my first words were daddy talks. And then I just wanted to talk like daddy. Rusty shares more about a class that really stuck out to him during his Purdue experience. He says it was a great example of how life works in the real world after graduation. I had a course my senior year. It was a script writing course. And the professor, was his name was Marv Diskin. I think I've got that right. I think he's since passed. But that course was the closest thing to the real world as any class that I had because we showed up the first day. He went over some of the basics of script writing. He gave us a handbook on how to write a movie. And then he said, I'll see you at the end of the semester. And you could come in and speak with him anytime you wanted, but there were deadlines and you had to get this script written. That's the real world. The real world is you don't get a chance to two days a week or three days a week, go in and have somebody check up on you. You know, you're given a task and you got a long time to do it and you better get it done and you better not wait till the last minute. You know, I learned so much in that process for life, you know, it's where I first came up with this thing. And I say to myself all the time, I say to others, you know, there's no stress in being early because if you wait to that last moment and try to finish something big like that and don't have milestones along the way, you will fail or you'll turn in something that's substandard. I learned so much from that class in a class that really wasn't a class. That was kind of one of those cool things that Purdue provided me. If you can't tell already, Rusty is outgoing, friendly, and easy to talk to. It was no surprise that he gained a great group of friends and got involved in Purdue organizations right away when he started here. In fact, he was given the honor of speaking at his commencement ceremony in 1984. Here's Rusty discussing what he spoke about in that commencement speech. It's an old motto that his mom used to tell him. Well, I was very fortunate that I got to speak at my commencement which was really cool. And back then, they didn't have a commencement speaker. You only had President Beering spoke, and then there would be a student response. And I remember using this line because it's also one of those sort of mantras for me. My mother gave it to me when I was seven years old. She said, tomorrow will go a lot better if you lay your clothes out the night before. You know, I lay my clothes out the night before when I got to get ready for tomorrow, whether it's to go for a run or go to a meeting or go to church, you know, or go travel. I lay them out the night before because it starts you off without having to worry about things. I feel like that's what Purdue did for me. Purdue laid my clothes out for me, you know, for what was going to be my career and my life. And it got me ready, not only academically, but socially and leadership wise from getting this chance to be a leader in old masters and being the president of mortar board and being a staff residence hall assistant. I mean, it just got me ready. And I think that maybe other universities could have also done that. I'm sure they could have, but this is the one that I went to. And this is the one that did that for me. And so I feel indebted for that experience. Granted, I paid for it. 
I paid to get that experience. But as President Daniels likes to talk about value, value for me is when my cost is superseded and exceeded by the quality of that experience or that product. My Purdue product, you know, the value is really high because the quality that I received versus the cost was off the charts. Purdue laid out Rusty's clothes for him. I love that. And we've definitely heard this type of idea before on the podcast, but not in these creative terms. Rusty tells us how he first dipped his toes into the business world. It was a job offer he got, well, sort of by accident. My first real business job was at Pratt & Whitney, which I actually got that job because I'd been, when I was getting my master's degree at Purdue, I was in the International Student Services offices doing an externship. And our director had not come in yet that morning. And the recruiter sat there and talked to me because I was the only one in the office. He actually said to me, I asked what he was doing. He goes, well, I'm from Pratt & Whitney. And we're here to, because try to figure out how do we recruit Chinese nationals who are getting education here to go back to China. And at the time, that's not what they wanted to do. They wanted to get jobs in the U.S. and stay in the U.S. and get their green card and, and stay in the United States. And I told him that. And I said, you know, your strategy is wrong. Your strategy should be hire them here and then transfer them on assignment back to China. And he's looking at me like I'm, you know, I'm a 22 year old kid. Like, you know, what do you know? You know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry. And about that time, you know, the director showed up and they went in, they had a conversation. And on the way out, he stopped by my little cubicle desk kind of thing I had there. And he said, do you have a resume? And I said, well, yeah, I do. And he goes, I'd like to take your resume back with me. And I said, okay, I thought maybe you'd be upset after our conversation. He goes, no, no, because I just got done meeting with your director and she said the exact same thing. And that's how I got my first job at Pratt & Whitney. But my first job was exactly one of the problems that I just got trying to describe because the best I could figure out about how to work was to go get an annual report that was a couple years out of date. And then I go and I interview. It wasn't the culture. What they showed me was not the culture that it turned out to be. And so, you know, I show up, you know, I got to wear a suit and tie, which everybody had to do back then, but it was beyond regimented. It was a world where you couldn't send a memo to the next level up without your boss editing it and approving. I mean, imagine in today's world where you couldn't send an email to somebody else without somebody editing it and approving it. That was the world I showed up. Now they made airplane engines and they were a big defense contractor. And so they needed a lot of process, a lot of structure. You know, you can't make mistakes. It was ingrained in that culture, but it was a huge shift for me, a huge shift. But in some ways you have to be a chameleon as it it relates to work, you know? And if you've made a choice, you know, I was always told anybody can do anything for two years, you know? And so I was like, I can do this for two years. And so I became a chameleon to try to adapt to that culture as best I could. And then I was fortunate that I got recruited away to go to Frito-Lay, fast-moving consumer goods company, marketing-driven. You know, even though I was working in manufacturing and sales at the time in HR, it was just a much freer environment, which is what I enjoy. Maybe why, you know, technology was something in entertainment that I gravitated to. As Rusty just said, he's touched a lot in the technology and entertainment world. He worked at Frito-Lay, part of the PepsiCo family, for 10 years and ended his career there as the Vice President of International Human Resources. Rusty then joined the video game company Electronic Arts, or EA, in 1998 and was responsible for global human resources, talent management, corporate services, facilities and real estate, corporate communications, and government affairs. So picture this, it's the late 90s and video games and computer games were just becoming popular. Were you there during this boom of video games? I was. I was. What was that experience like? It was uh, like riding a rocket ship, but not inside, outside, and just trying to hang on. I mean, it was, the growth was so tremendous. And at the time, you'd put out a game and it would sell 5 million copies. And this was before it was downloaded. They were packaged goods at that time. You just put it out and it would sell and they would just keep selling. They would keep selling. And so we just kept growing and growing as a company. And I was so fortunate because anything that wasn't kind of nailed down, they'd say, well, you know, or it needed to be new, you know, Rusty, you take that, you go. So if I'd been in a a more stodgier or a more established older company, like I'd come out of PepsiCo, you'd never would have got those kind of chances. It was like riding a rocket ship. It was so much fun. Growth is an amazing, amazing elixir. You know, it's intoxicating. It's not always good. 
not always good. You know, growth can mask a lot of problems. And then when you don't, growth slows down, you go, oh, wow, I didn't see that. Well, it's because we were only looking up there. We were never looking where we should have. But I would just encourage anybody, you get a chance to go work for a growth company, drop what you're doing because you'll have an experience that you may never be able to replicate. I couldn't replicate that again. It would be impossible. Okay, so after that experience of riding a rocket ship, Rusty led Snowcap as the CEO. Snowcap was the world's first end-to-end solution for digital license and copyright management services, empowering record labels and individual artists to monetize their digital creations on popular sites such as MySpace and other social networks. With Snowcap, Rusty found himself back in that music and entertainment space. And Rusty wouldn't be a Boilermaker if he didn't persevere after facing challenges, specifically some challenges during his time at Snowcap. When you've had all these experiences and all these different jobs within this business world, is there a specific challenge that you had to overcome that really sticks out to you? And how did you overcome that? Well, when I became a CEO of the venture back company, Snowcap, so I had spent I don't know, 15, almost 20 years, you know, learning this HR stuff and telling other people how they should run businesses. And now it was on me. So everything that I had learned, now I've got to do it myself. Just because you think you know it doesn't mean you really know it until you do it. Nobody, you know, the the old adage, you stand where you sit until you sit in the chair and the buck stops with you. You're the leader that everybody's counting on to keep a company funded, to keep a company's strategic growth going, to hire the right people, to make the right partnerships and business deals. You don't care how much you think you know it until you do. I loved it. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I loved it. It's arguable whether or not I was good at it or not, because it was my first time doing it. And maybe I really wasn't as good at it as I thought I could have been. I chose not to do it again because after the Great Recession, We'd sold the company. You know, I just said, look, there's other things that I can do with my time. And and I've been fortunate enough coming out of EA that I had the resources to be able to make some choices. But I would say that those almost three years were as much as I could tell you, felt like drinking out of a fire hose, you know, being a quarterback where you got 300 pound linebackers coming at you at 60 miles an hour and knocking you down. It felt like that for three years. It ended well, but I wasn't sure it was going to end well. And you never quite know when you're in that situation. It's why a lot of companies that get acquired or CEOs that take their companies public at some point or another will decide to go do something else. I mean, CEO turnovers, I think average tenure is like less than three years. It used to be like five years. Well, why? Because it's a really hard job. It's a really hard job. And I, you know, I'm glad I learned it, but it was one where I felt all the pressure that one can imagine. Rusty has had a lot of amazing and unique experiences, but I personally was the most curious about his experience with President Barack Obama and becoming coordinating national co-chair for Technology for Obama. Rusty tells us about his involvement with starting and leading something that had never been done before during President Obama's second run for office. I had not really been involved in politics. I liked the idea that government was for the people and that government should be able to do good things but really had not been a passion of mine. And so in 2007, I had gotten a chance to meet the then Senator Obama. I guess maybe it was 2006, early 2007. And because I had, um, at Electronic Arts, at that time, the corporate communications and a number of different things reported through to me. And I'd gone to Washington a, a few times And um, actually, I think corporate affairs was reporting to me at that time as well. So I'd gone to Washington, and that was at a time that Hillary Clinton was really trying to push down video games. And so we had some meetings, we met with her, and I ran into this really cool guy, you know, Barack Obama from Illinois. I thought that, wow, this guy's going to go someplace someday. And in 2007, you know, he announces his presidential election. And they asked me if I wanted to get involved. And I said, I can't get involved because I'm running a startup. The world was about to fall apart with the Great Recession. And I was like, I got to keep my startup out of the dead pool. But if there's a 2012, call me back. So in 2011, in August, they called me back and asked me if I would fly over to Chicago to see them. I was at our home in Rhode Island. I went there and they wanted to create a thing called Technology for Obama to get digital technologists aligned behind the president 
not only for fundraising, but for staffing of the team, resourcing of new technologies. And they were looking for someone to be the national coordinating co-chair, and they chose me. I hadn't done any of this stuff before, but I had the requisite experiences. The requisite experience was, first of all, I had time. At that point, we had sold Snowcap, so I had time and was able to reallocate that. The second thing is that I had learned throughout my career that leading from behind and leading through others was extraordinarily productive, as well as just a great way to treat other people. In a role like what they were asking me to do, where we ended up with 150 plus national co-chairs who were all powerful, all successful CEOs, political philanthropists, politicians, you know, you learn if you want anything that everybody's got to feel like they're a leader and you've got to lead from behind. So I had this kind of in my skill toolbox, if you will. And the third part of it was, is that I can coordinate things. I can take large groups of people and figure out how to marshal them all in a direction, administratively stay on top of it and make everybody feel like they're moving in the same direction and feeling really good about it. So it was like the perfect storm. The Obama people didn't know I could do that. The Obama people just looked at me and said, well, this is a guy, he's got time and you know we need somebody and he's got a pretty large network of people and he lives in Silicon Valley. He ought to be able to do that. They had no idea that I actually, I knew that I, I had the skills to do it. And it was a phenomenal experience. We were very successful on all fronts. And, you know, it kind of scratched my itch around politics. I did similar in the Biden campaign with Innovators for Biden and was a, on the leader, executive leadership team for that. But there's been nothing like that experience of Tech for Obama. And I probably will never get that again. It's like one of those once in a lifetime moments because we were starting something that had never been started before. That was awesome. In 2014, President Obama also appointed Rusty to the Advisory Board for the Arts at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Arts. So after all of those career experiences, what's something that Rusty is really excited about at the moment? When you look at all the different projects that you're involved in, and like you said, all your different hats that you wear, is there a certain project right now that you're really excited about that you want to share with the listeners? So not so much as one, but a collection of philosophy that I'm really excited about. So I spent a lot of years before I became a a CEO and before I do the things that I do now, sitting on boards and all that, I was in the human capital space. So I led human resources plus a bunch of other things at EA. And then I came out of PepsiCo and Pepsi where I'd been an executive in the human resource function. One of the things, and, and my hip pocket skill was always talent acquisition and recruiting. I loved it. I thought it was way beyond just staffing a company. I felt like it was matchmaking to the dreams of individuals to get them in a place where they could reach their full potential. And maybe they're not going to be there forever, but this will progress them. It'll make them better. And that to me felt very redeeming. I love that kind of matchmaking. But what I saw happen for so many years is that companies and cultures of companies were not actually as transparent or as truthful as they needed to be. And candidates didn't always have the full story or a way of getting the full story. So when I was approached in 2007 to be the first board member, uh, independent board member of Glassdoor, I saw my first, wait, 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 there can be transparency. We can actually make this better so that people don't make a bad job change decision or a company doesn't make a bad hiring decision. A company makes a bad hiring decision, it hurts the company, but what it really does is it hurts the individual. You know, an individual loses their job after six months, they gave up another job, they moved, maybe their family moved with them, their kids are watching all this happen, and they didn't get it right. You know, it'll say, oh, the fit just wasn't there. You know, it's not only damage to the individual financially, but their confidence level how people think of them forever. They'll be asked about what happened in that six months when you made that move and they'll try to explain, but people will be questioned. And then you'll see kids that were involved in all of that who go someday grow up and go, well, you know, I don't trust companies. Well, why would they? Why would they? They saw what happened here. So I have been spending all of my time and energy that I have for investing and advising and starting new companies with the philosophy of, can we please eliminate the bad hire? 
the bad hiring. And if we did, we can make people's work and the idea of work so much better. And we wouldn't have these damaged individuals and we wouldn't have companies that spend all this extra money. So I've got a number of projects now, startups, different technologies, and it's like a portfolio. And they're all focused on the same thing, making that decision with all the data and information that you need so that you've made the best decision you can make to spare an individual and a company of what could be a disaster. We all know now that Rusty has done a lot with his career after Purdue. And Rusty is still incredibly involved with his alma mater. He serves on the Purdue President's Champions Council and the College of Liberal Arts Dean's Advisory Committee. He was named a Distinguished Purdue Alumni in 2003. And Rusty and his wife, Patty, are also the benefactors for the Patty and Rusty Roof School of Design, Art, and Performance on Purdue's campus. Why was it so important to Rusty and his wife to give back to Purdue? So I've always said that I can tell what's important to people if I have two things. If you give me your credit card statement and your calendar. In fact, I could probably get it down to priorities in the right order. Because where we put our resources and where we put our time is what's important to us. And so because I had received so much from the university and I was fortunate, I mean, I went to school on Pell Grants. I worked jobs. I worked on the radio. I did different externships to make a little extra money. I didn't come from means. I was fortunate to be able to have a skill like working on the radio that could really pay the extra and help me through. Becoming a residence hall assistant was a really big deal because at the time they paid room, board, and tuition, room, board, tuition, and $25 a month, which was a lot of money back then. So I looked at that and I said, I was really fortunate that all those things I had to be able to fund my way through. But there's so many kids where that's not the case. So what do you do? You give back in ways that you want to make sure that the institution can give every student the greatest opportunity that they can get. You want to do things where you can financially support the institution so that it can do things like what President Daniels has done and keep tuition flat for 11 years, which everybody said he was crazy, myself included. You know, when I first got to know him right before he'd been named president, but he hadn't taken over yet. And he was looking for this common denominator, you know, and what is it that could really show that the university was moving in a different direction? And he found it with this idea of value. So for me to be able to support an institution that does things like that so that it can make it affordable for everyone to have the experience that I had and even maybe a better experience because of the resourcing and support that myself and others have done. It's not a choice for me. It's almost like I owe it. I feel like I owe it. And so, yeah, it's just kind of the way it it got down inside of me and it's not going to go away. You touched on your dad, you know, being really into the arts and performing. Tell us why you chose to give back in that way to the school as well. The visual and performing arts, because it's been something that's so important to me. You know, if you give me my perfect day, I would throw theater into my perfect day because I just love, love, love theater. I love music. I love literature. I love art, you know, visual art. So all those things, again, I think are the product of what you're raised with. When I worked my way through my career and I ended up in video games, which is an entertainment medium, it just wasn't an entertainment medium that I knew about, you know, when I was coming through school and it was there, but it was like a arcade kind of niche thing over to the side. But when I got to EA and got a chance to kind of see where I thought the world was going and watching the next generation of kids who we used to, every day was a great day when I was in video games because somebody turned 10 years old, you know, and they would pick up that controller. And instead of asking mom or dad, you know, what should I do? You know, somewhere between eight and 10 years old, you make your own decision. They pick up a video game controller. That's all great. but. You know, there are certain entertainment mediums that can draw you away from other entertainment mediums like live theater, like live music, like going to a museum and experiencing visual art in a way that you don't experience any other place. That if we don't support those art forms, will they die? They may not die totally, but they will wither to the point that they won't become a part of our culture and our society. Live theater, music, visual and performing arts are a lot of places 
where you can see the reflection of humanity. You can see and learn about yourself through those mediums. And so when it became time for me to think about how I wanted to give back to Purdue, again, it was an easy choice for me because, you know, in some ways, who else is going to do it? You know, I've got to do it because if I don't do it, then it might not get done. And I wanted to set an example. You know, it was very interesting. President Jiski was the president at the time, and, and my wife and I sat with him and the head of development at that time as well. And we were going to give the gift anonymously because I knew that a gift of that size was going to cause me trouble. Uh, family, friends, work relationships, people sitting there going, wait a minute, if he's got that much money to give away, then how much money is he making? And, da, 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 you know, we said we wanted to give it anonymously. And President Jitsky said, if you're going to give it anonymously, I'm not going to take it. And we're like, you're not going to take it? He goes, no. He goes, because anonymous never inspired anyone. You're young. You've been successful. You're passionate. You can inspire not only students and faculty from a gift that you give, but also maybe a generation to come who never thought about being generous with their resources and thinking philanthropy was something important. It was like the best line ever. I said, okay we're good. We're good. We'll use our name and let's go. I've raised millions and millions of dollars myself for other institutions. And I've used that line a bunch of times because anonymous, it's true, never inspired anybody. And not only is Rusty a philanthropist for his alma mater, he also stays involved in what's happening within the Purdue community, whether it's speaking to a class about his experiences or impacting young entrepreneurs. He discusses what this special network of Boilermakers means to him. Number one, it keeps you young. There's no better way to stay young than staying involved with a, a university or staying involved with education. I mean, you could do that in your local community too, and people should. Just because their kids have graduated on and gone from high school or elementary school doesn't mean that you can't stay involved with the schools that they went to. So that's number one. Number two is I still think I have something to give back, not only financially, but I've gotten a chance to be in a place in our country, in our world that's on the cutting edge. And the cutting edge of technology and what we've seen and what's coming, if I can share a little bit of that back, you know, with a little bit of pattern recognition to say, oh, I saw this in the 90s. It showed back up in the early 2000s. Oh, there's a version of it. It's coming now. Here's how it might work. And I can pass that along because experience is really expensive, you know, but if I could pass it back along to the, the next budding entrepreneur, the next teacher who's going to, to go out and do that, or the next artist that wants to go and create, then I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And so Purdue is extraordinarily welcoming to any alumni that wants to come and give back with their time just as much as their resources. And so I take advantage of every chance I get. I mean, one of the sad parts about the last two years with the pandemic is not being able to do that live. You know, I'm looking forward to this coming fall to be back on campus for the first time in a pandemic, to get back to where I feel like I belong. I like to ask our This Is Purdue guests what advice they have for current Purdue students. It's something I myself think about often too. Rusty's advice here was something that really struck me. And it's something so many people take for granted. The world gets so much smaller after one graduates from college. The world will never be bigger for you than the first day you step on campus at some place, especially some place big like Purdue. You know, once you graduate from college, you decide you're going to go work in a company. You've got a functional expertise. They're going to put you in a department. You're going to be involved with the same people most of the time in a community or maybe not in a community. In today's world, you might be working remotely forever, but you'll be in, involved in a community. Your friends will become the friends that you work with or very close proximity-wise then someday you hope you'll say to yourself, wow, it's a really big world. I should probably go and learn some things, travel, find some other things. You might look back and go, well, wait a minute. All that was at my fingertips when I was at Purdue. You don't know who you're going to be sitting next to, who they're going to be, what they're going to become, the experiences that you can have by staying connected with people. And you have no idea that the things that you won't find elsewhere in life, that if you go and experiment and you go to things that you wouldn't think you were going to go to, and you just try it once, that can become a lifelong passion. And you think about how many kids come through the university and they say, well, the only sports that two sports I saw is I went to some basketball games and I went to a couple football games. But what about everything else? 
Or you go to the International Student Services Center and you go and you learn, you just say, hey, I want to know about different cultures. And the next thing you know, you have friends that, you know, you'll learn not only about their lifestyles from where they're from, you'll learn about their food, you'll learn about what to do. And someday you'll go to that country and say, you know, I'm familiar because I had that experience. Take advantage of every single thing. I'd love to see the experiment of somebody who can actually, from day one, when they come to a place like Purdue, anybody they get to know, they collect their name, their email address, and their cell phone number and keep in touch with them over time. Because you could do that today. I couldn't do that. There was no way to keep in touch. Because again, you don't know where people are going to go and how you can help them and what they might do to turn around and help you. I mean, I had no idea that when Bob Peterson and I were both staff residents in Young Hall, that he would turn out to be, you know, an Oscar winning, you know, he was a cartoonist at the time and mechanical engineer, an Oscar winning guy from Pixar, who I still keep in touch with, you know, so you just have to think about all your time at Purdue. Every day is an experiment. Every day is a new collection of experience and a collection of relationships. And if you miss that, you've missed so much of what college is really about. It's so true. You think you have all the time in the world to make new friendships, network, have new experiences, and then poof, your four years is already up. So why is Rusty proud to be a Boilermaker? What makes Purdue unique in his eyes? Well, I think it's in the product that it produces. So I don't really think I can remember any experience running into a Purdue alumni, young, old, whatever, that I didn't like them. And I think there's something about either being from or going to school in the Midwest. You learn to work. You also learn of long suffering if you're a Purdue sports fan. You learn that delayed gratification is something that one has to work for. While the university doesn't espouse morals and values that they put into their students. I do believe that, you know, when President Daniels talks about grit, and I think this work ethic, I think that is put there. When you have a strong work ethic and you have to work for what you get, you're appreciative and you don't feel entitled. And I believe that that's part of the product that Purdue puts out. If we didn't put that out, if we put out people and students that were not successes, both in their occupation, but also successes as being a parent or a civic leader or, you know, involved in uh, their communities, then I probably wouldn't be as proud of it as I am. You know, you can be jaded and you can be blinded, but, you know, there's plenty of universities that I know and friends that I have that don't look back at their university or their college and have that same feeling. I think they've seen products that aren't reflective of what they're proud of. And I'm just proud of our product. May we continue just to produce more and more and more of it. The world needs it. You talked about sports a little bit. What does that Boilermaker spirit mean to you when it comes to our athletics community? I did say long suffering. I mean, there is a little bit of that, you know. (laughs) That's true. That's true. I tweeted a few weeks ago that really the John Purdue Club should, every year when we renew our, our membership, should really send us that Purdue branded defibrillator. Because at some point or another, we need it. I love the fact, like, I'm on this big text chain with a whole bunch of the uh, mortarboarders that I graduated with. And just texting and being a part of the games. And, and then I have football tickets that I never get a chance to come back to see. I've had football tickets for 25 years. One of my best friends from college uses them. He's put four kids through Purdue, so he deserves to be able to use them. I think athletics are also a part of the college experience. If you go to college and you don't experience athletics and don't understand what it's like to everybody in unison to be cheering for the same thing and to be putting all your energy into it and being, you know, on the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, you know, depending on on how a game comes out, you've missed something, you know, so many places in the United States and especially in rural areas. They don't get a chance to do that once you graduate. So it's another one of those things that go back to the beginning, you know, go get every experience. But I love the Purdue spirit. I completely agree. Experiencing all of those Big Ten athletics rivalries and being surrounded by thousands of cheering fans at a place you love so dearly are the times I will never forget from my Purdue experience. Rusty leaves us with one last piece of advice. I would just say this. There are no easy answers to what life will be after you graduate. 
I would encourage everyone to think about, you know, whether you've ever been on a sailboat or know how a sailboat moves, you know, don't have the expectation that your career or your life is a battleship. It's a sailboat, which means that it tacks. It goes along with the wind in a direction, and then the wind will shift or you have to shift, and then it'll tack back. And your life is this series of sort of diagonal moves. But what's most important is that you have a lighthouse, that you've got a lighthouse in front of you that you're sailing towards whether it be a lighthouse for your career. Mine was always to be back in entertainment and media. I got there. I tacked a lot of different ways to finally get back to that. Or it's to be the civic leader, or it's to be the parent that you want to be, or the teacher that you want to be. It doesn't matter what it is, but if you've got a lighthouse, you will be able to tack your way to it. You won't always get it right. Sometimes you'll stay on a wind that's too long, and sometimes you'll come off too early. But if you keep that lighthouse, you may not even be able to describe it yet. All you can do is just see that there's a structure out there, and every few minutes or every few seconds, something flashes in front of you. But as you get closer, it becomes clearer and clearer. You know, where I am in my life, you know, I feel very fortunate. I feel Purdue was a big piece of that. My faith has been a big piece of that. My relationships, my wife has been a big piece of that. You know, in the years to come when I land that boat, it's not exactly there, but it's pretty close to the lighthouse that I've been trying to get to for a lot of years. And so I would just encourage all of our listeners, every student, dream about that lighthouse, write it down, hold on to it, and tack your way there. The wind will be in your back. The wind will be in your sails. You can reach that lighthouse. It was an absolute pleasure talking to Rusty. Okay, but we have one last question. Are you a Boilermaker who says, Hail Purdue? Or Boiler Up? Hail Purdue, Boiler Up. We didn't have Boiler Up. That happened after Joe Tiller's wife started doing the Boiler Up thing. And it's actually how I can tell when somebody graduates. You know, if I say I see somebody in the airport wearing Purdue stuff or I got my stuff on, you know, I'll say Hail Purdue. And if they say Hail Purdue, they're my age. If they say Boiler Up, I know they're a lot younger. <laughs> if you're enjoying our This Is Purdue episodes, be sure to leave us a review with your feedback. And follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify to never miss an episode. Thanks for listening to This is Purdue. For more information on this episode, visit our website at purdue.edu slash podcast. There you can head over to your favorite podcast app to subscribe and leave us a review. And as always, boiler up. <laughs>